Well, thank you. Uh, let me make clear uh, that I am simply the messenger. I didn't uh, have anything to do with the message. I just found a lot of things lying around and thought it might be possible to package them a little bit more effectively, and that's what Dan and I have been doing for many years. And I do try, though, not to uh, get confused. I never invented anything, and I don't actually do anything. You know? <laughs> I'm just standing here breathing. And by the way, I don't get paid anything uh, for this kind of thing either. But you know, that does seem to be sort of a, you know, an appropriate way to do it. So uh, I was uh, asked to come in uh, today. I have been here many times. I thought myself too many times. They said, I said, surely you don't want me back. But here I am, so OK, I, I was asked to do this. Um, and I have learned today something, which is, I think, good, that you are in favor of changing the world. Uh, John told us this morning he's in favor of changing the world. Bob Chapman at lunch is in favor of changing the world. Uh, I think many of you are in favor of changing the world. And not only that, positively. Not just messing it up further, but you're interested in positive change. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So I thought, well, gosh, I should do my part. I want to get with the program. And let me say, if I haven't made it clear, I am in favor of positively changing the world through the breakthrough method. OK? So what can I do? And I decided I would bring along today a map of the world. Okay, So we have to start somewhere. So this is a current state map of the world. Now this, of course, is not what you expected to see. You thought it would be one of those old-fashioned geopolitical maps. Uh, this is the world of the provider. That's you when you're getting paid. Uh, in your life, you have two hats. You have a provider hat that you wear at the office or the plant. And you have a consumer hat that you wear for about another eight hours a day, and then you get to sleep. So you're either wearing your provider hat or your consumer hat. And this is the world of the provider. And behold, it is vertical. Uh, now, who's up at the top there? That's the C-suite. Uh, with the truly high-priced help. And they are up there in a position of authority, uh, sending down uh, commands and metrics uh, for people in those verticals to meet. And those verticals are actually a fractal, in the sense that you can think of those verticals in a plant as receiving and inspection and materials preparation and fabrication and assembly and test and inspection and shipping. So those are the verticals in a plant. And in a company, you would have purchasing, and you would have pc and and operations and sales. And then you can back up one more. And those verticals are the raw material supplier and the second tier piece part maker and the first tier component system maker and the OEM that puts the components together for a complete product and the distributor and the retailer. So it works at any level that in the world of the provider, things are vertical. And by the way, everybody, and if you don't know this, you should know this, is oriented facing up okay, toward your boss and your boss's boss and his or her boss all the way up to the very top if you have any interest whatever in your career. Okay, Just want to make that clear to everybody. You should be facing up. Okay. <laughs> well, OK, that's the provider map of the world. Here is the customer map of the world. This is the one you are interested in immediately the second you leave the company. That your entire view of the world changes. Because what you're now interested in is the horizontal flow of value across organizations to get to you to solve your problems. <clears throat> we are all consumers or customers because we're trying to solve problems. And those red lines are for product families that you as a customer are interested in. And then here's what happens when the world comes together. We get that. And the important point for this moment is that vertical trumps horizontal, that those poor red lines are trying to get through this thicket of stuff, things they keep bumping into to try to provide value for the customer. And we would, I think, like to do better. If we really want to change the world, we need to think more like this. Now, by the way, you must have verticals. The world will always have verticals. Toyota is a totally vertical organization. Uh, on their good days, on their good days, and you can talk to Ray about that on Thursday. On their good days, however, they've been really good at finding ways to put the horizontal in the foreground and the vertical in the background. 
Because don't forget, the customer over there on the right side has no interest whatsoever in the mayhem that your verticals create while they're trying to get their value. They do not care, and neither do you once you leave the company. So our challenge is how we can get to a world where we have the horizontal in the foreground and the necessary vertical in the background doing what it needs to do. So a year ago, uh, when the planning for this conference started, by the way, they'll be planning next week, probably for 2014. There's an amazing amount of planning that goes on at AME, and it's all volunteer. A year ago, uh, we got together, and I was asked to uh, think about some things we might do. And Dan McDonald uh, said, gee, why don't we make a breakthrough end to end? You've talked about it, uh, Dan and Jim, that's me and Dan. Uh, did the light blue book called Seeing the, um, you know, the Extended Value Stream. Uh, very interesting that uh, we've sold about 5% as many copies of Seeing the Whole as we have of Learning to See. And by the way, they're the exact same book. It's really kind of interesting. You didn't have to buy both, and maybe that's why people didn't buy the blue when it came later, the light blue. But the fact is, it is hard. It is so hard. But unless you can really look end to end on those red lines, you really have not done the job for your customer. And that means, by the way, that you are less likely as an organization, all those verticals, to prosper. So as we were looking at that a year ago, I said, well, why don't we try an experiment and take a walk? You know how I love to take a walk. Let's take a walk end to end and see what we can learn. And then Dan did something that, um, speaking of being uh, vertically oriented, may or may not be a smart uh, career move, he volunteered his boss. <laughs> so Todd, I know annual review is coming soon. You can do you know, what you will with this. But uh, Dan, uh, for the moment, uh, reports to Todd. And he is the guy who does operational excellence at Ingersoll Rand. So uh, I have no Gimba. Don't forget, by the way, I'm just the messenger, not the message. I have no Gimba. I don't do anything. So someone has to provide me a place where people, humans, are trying to create value to permit a discussion about how we could create value in a better way. So that somebody is Ingersoll Rand and Todd. Now, just one more thing. He was reluctant to get up here because he said, look, we're just a short ways along the journey. It's going to make it sound like we at Ingersoll think we've done it all. And by the way, there are 80 Ingersoll people here today, which is a great thing. Uh, these are humble people. These are humble people, trust me. Uh, they're not making any claims about what they've done. They just want to tell you about how they got started. And by the way, they've been working to this point within the verticals, within the plant, within departments. And they're now at a point where they're starting to think about how do we go end to end and put all the pieces together. So Todd is going to talk about what you've done so far. And then we're going to talk about something we did together. Great. Thanks, Jim. It's uh, very humbling here to be here with all of you, all the expertise in this room, especially side by side with Jim. Uh, Jim did mention that uh, Dan, uh, we work together. Dan's been an unbelievable coach over the last six years uh, and really uh, helping me uh, along my journey. And I do want to recognize if uh, all the Ingersoll colleagues could stand up in the room and just, because uh, this journey is about our team, uh, not about me or the people doing so. I just want to recognize the entire team that's in the room today. So let me start with just uh, telling you a little bit about our company. Uh, it's changed a lot over the last uh, 10 years. I, can, I know that when my CEO, uh, Mike Lamarck, called me, uh, I thought Ingersoll was the old Ingersoll, which was uh, we're very famous for our construction equipment, which was uh, sold off uh, in this past decade uh, to uh, Doosan. Uh, and today, uh, we're a $14 billion operating company, diversified industrial, uh, made up of five big brands uh, that I think you'd recognize, and they're on the chart there. So Club Car, uh, Ingersoll ran where we make compressors and tools, uh, Schlage, which is our security business, along with many other great brands uh, across the world, uh, Schlage, Schlage being really a North American brand. Uh, and this part of the business is about $2 billion that we'll actually be splitting uh, off into a separate public company uh, at the end of the year. Uh, Thermal King, which is uh, refrigeration for truck and trailer and rail and marine. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the great brand of Train. Uh, these brands alone uh, could be standing on their own. They, you know, as you know, they're, they're, a lot of these brands are iconic. 
Um, but Ingersoll is a total company. We're 142 years old. Uh, our journey started about four years ago uh, when Mike became the CEO. And uh, we re re at that time, we really were a holding company of these great brands. Uh, and Mike's vision was to really uh, bring together uh, these great brands and, and drive an operating culture, uh, drive an operating company. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last four years. So when you do that, uh, you've got to aspire for something. And uh, we aspired to have premier performance. And that, we weren't really sure what that meant in the beginning. Uh, the great words. Um, but what we did is we took a bunch of metrics that were, you could easily get through an 8K. Uh, and we went out to 17 benchmark company 8Ks, and we plotted things like revenue growth, uh, operating margins, uh, return on invested capital, working capital as a percent of revenue. And we've got about uh, 16 metrics that we look at uh, every quarter. And that first quarter, when we put that together, it was pretty humbling uh, because we were literally almost bottom quartile in every one of the metrics as we put the company together. And so we had these great brands uh, and individually, people thought they were doing quite well, but as a total company, we really weren't. Uh, and we weren't delivering to the shareholder, we weren't delivering to our employees, and, uh, and in some cases, we weren't delivering to our customers. So we stepped back and we said, we need a strategy. And uh, over the last four years, these have been our, th our, our three strategies. Uh, not 10, not 15, not a dozen, it's been three, and it's been very consistent. Uh, it's been around operational excellence, uh, which is uh, our words for our lean transformation. Uh, it's been around growth uh, and really trying to drive a culture of growth. And then lastly, and most importantly, it's been around our people and really trying to drive a culture inside the company around a progressive, diverse, and inclusive uh, culture. And I can go into uh, that real quick, um, but it's really what it is, is trying to build a place that Bob talked a lot about uh, at lunchtime, a building a place where people want to be a part of. Uh, people uh, want to work for Ingersoll Rand, and that's not where we were, and that's not really where we are today. Um, we actually are quite encouraged. We just got our employee engagement survey back. Uh, we do an annual survey. And it's been something we've been working on for the last four years, and for three years, we have not been able to move the needle. And uh, we just got our survey back, and we went up eight points. Uh, and for anybody who does survey work, um, it's pretty spectacular. It's, um, you move this thing three points, it's very statistically uh, 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 reflective of a, of a very big change. And so going up eight points was uh, a huge start to our journey, what Bob talks about, about making a place where people want to be a part of. So this is all about our employees. It's all about our customers and all about our shareholders. When you decide you want to go do Premier Performance, and we talk about this benchmark, uh, I want to just share some of the results, and then I'll get into the, a little bit of the how. Uh, so we started out, and again, uh, early on, these metrics were not in, a good, in good places. Um, there's still a lot of these metrics are not in good places, but what we're proud about is the movement. Uh, so here you can see the metrics, uh, and I don't, I don't have each one of the metrics labeled, um, but what's happened here is every single metric since 08 has at least gone up one quartile. So we would describe Premier Performance as having all of these metrics in the top quartile and really being a leader amongst our peer group. And these are great peers. These are some of our comp uh, competitors, uh, other diversified industrials that we don't compete against other than shareholders, investors, uh, which we think is another, another form of competition about where people want to put their money. So we're very proud of this. Uh, we're also proud over the last four years in our space and diversified industrials. Our operating leverage and our shareholder return has been in the top 90th percentile. Uh, so uh, there's a lot going on. But as Jim said, there's still a long way to go, and we are nowhere near uh, I, I would say we're infantile in this journey. So let me talk a little bit about the how. Um, so a group of leaders got together four years ago, and we really talked about moving a company from being a holding company to a operating company. And we knew uh, right from the start when I interviewed with Mike that we saw things very similar, about lean was going to be the way we were going to do this. Uh, Mike had had an opportunity when he was working for JCI to run a seat company over in Japan uh, that was sequencing into Toyota and to Honda and Nissan. Uh, clearly, the best lean leader we have in the entire company is Mike, and we're really blessed to have a leader like that, uh, that you're not selling, that you're not trying to keep on the program. Uh, it's not a program. It, it, we really just see this is the way we want to do things. And again, we're just starting, and we're very early. But we knew from the start we wanted to be programmatic. 
Uh, we knew we had to put something together with real capability that was going to be sustaining and was really going to have a, a sustainability over time. Because uh, anybody who's been and seen some success, it's really hard work to get there and probably even harder to sustain it. And it's so fragile uh, that with just small leadership changes, you can take years of progress and, and have things collapse. So we talked about this thing about going in, in, in a mile deep and an inch wide. And we started out with a very, very small piece of the company. Uh, it was really debated hard amongst the leaders because we were so used to that everybody would kind of you know, start at once. And even people were saying no plant left behind in the beginning. Uh, but we knew that wasn't going to get us to where we were. If we really went out broad, it wasn't going to be sustaining. Uh, we, Dan and I went out and we benchmarked. Uh, we talked to a lot of people. Uh, it's, it feels very humbling, but also great to be able to give some, something back to the lean community because my experience has been, whether it's been Herman Miller or, or, or Jim or John Shook or George, George Conesager, this is a group of people that no matter where you go, people give their time and their experiences. And it's just, I think it's, it's the culture of, of what lean does in, in, in a community. So we went out, we spent a day with George, and George told us, you can't do this without gold deployment. And I had never done gold deployment in my life. Dan hadn't done gold deployment. Uh, we came back to Mike and the team. We said, boy, we're hearing from a lot of places consistent message that gold deployment's got to be a part of this. So we put together uh, uh, a team uh, to work on gold deployment. Uh, it's been ugly along the way. Um, uh, the biggest thing I'd say at Shear and, and, and along this path, and this is year four, we're going through our Hoshin process right now, um, it's, it's messy. It's, uh, you're learning along the way. Uh, and I'd say the biggest learnings for us has probably been around prioritization. So you take those three strategies and you say how you're going to do that and what's going to be important inside the company. And if you went to Mike's calendar, you know, you'd see that whatever's in North Box, that's what Mike's going to spend time on. And for other leaders who are learning uh, what this is about, uh, it's really been about how to get those other things off your calendar. Uh, to really understand these are the most important things. And if we do these things, then we're really going to drive to the right place. I'd say the other piece is around metrics on the East Box. Uh, for us, there's probably been too many. There's probably still too many. Uh, and then really trying to look for those true driver metrics. Um, we, uh, we're making progress there uh, that we think we've moved from kind of just analytical metrics at the end of a month or the end of a quarter that tell us what we're doing on performance like the previous page to really trying to get some metrics that are telling us what's going on uh, inside today or inside the week uh, and getting back forth to being more, uh, uh, more telling. And then this last thing that we're here to talk about this morning in a little bit more detail is this horizontal value stream. We knew that we wanted to go uh, end to end. Uh, a lot of debate about, you know, was this a factory thing? Was this a cost thing? Uh, right from day one, uh, we've been very clear. I'm not sure everybody believed us, but right from day one, this was about growth. And this was about this horizontal value stream getting to a customer and providing the customer with a differentiated service or product, uh, something that was going to stick out and actually be uh, a solution for them. And so uh, you know, we think about this in kind of three pieces uh, because the cycles of, of, um, of each one of these pieces of the horizontal value stream happen in a different pace. But everything from concept to launch to order to delivery to uh, delivery to the life cycle of the product, including services. So we're on this journey, and it's early, uh, but we're seeing some, some real good results. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, the leadership, uh, the, some of the learnings that we've had along the way. Uh, we started, again, when you think about these value streams, you've got to start somewhere. So even though you have a grandiose plan about going from concept all the way to through life cycle, uh, there's uh, a place you've got to start, and in most places, in fact, we had 19 original value streams in the company. It covered about 17% of our cost base. Um, and uh, we started really with 15 of them being ordered to ship and four of them being, quote, to cash. Uh, so we started out with plant managers kind of being the leaders. And we very quickly learned that these are not the place, if you don't want to drive, if you really want to drive growth, plant managers is not the place to lead a horizontal value stream. And so we quickly pivoted to uh, a product manager. What we realized there is product management inside the company was also something new, that we were building that capability. And they really didn't have the influence. Uh, they were more marketeers. Uh, and they really didn't know what to do and what strings to pull. And so uh, this latest uh, pivot has been around what we're calling product growth teams. And this is led by product management. And we're, again, we're really trying to build capability in, inside of that vertical around product management, around 
what are the things you do as a good product manager, but it's also along with a team, along with a team of engineering, along with a team of operations, uh, which for, for us would mean you know, manufacturing and procurement. And so that's where we are today in each one of our value streams. Uh, we've got some experiments going, uh, but product growth teams are really starting to catch some fire. We've got eight experiments going on in the company where we've got true uh, uh, capability building that we're really trying to uh, separate out results from with these product growth teams. And so uh, it's, it's early. It's early in the process, and we'll see if there's another pivot, but, but this is where we are today. Uh, the other thing I'd like to share this morning along our journey of learning is around daily management. Uh, you know, our partner today, and Greg's here, uh, has been a great partner, uh, Simpler. Uh, they have been a great help along the way. Um, and I don't mean this in a, in a bad way because there's probably lots of uh, different consulting companies out there, but our experience, Dan and mine, and our team's experience has been a lot of people focus on Kaizen. And uh, people do Kaizen and Kaizen and Kaizen and Kaizen and Kaizen. And you come back and things fall apart again. And so this whole process around daily management that Dan and I and we've been working with Greg and the team on is, uh, is something I don't think a lot, I know my experience, we, we haven't done well in my past life and, and where we are today. And we're really spending a lot of time here. And when I think about this, this is the secret sauce. And I kind of fell into it. And I'll tell you a quick, quick story. Um, I was running uh, an operation and uh, we were going through and we had a, uh, a product launch uh, that took about 15 months. And uh, we got done with the first prototype and hit the shop floor and we built it. And the customer came in to look at the product and we realized that it was built to the wrong size. And when I say built to the wrong size, I mean like really built to the wrong size. And we didn't believe it because the customer was, uh, was hadn't ordered a product uh, from a new product in about 30 years who's using the same type of product. And I'm trying to protect the innocence here. Uh, it's a past life. So uh, this was now, uh, this was now uh, back in June, uh, and uh, we had to have the product delivered by the end of the year. And it's a 15-month cycle from engineering, and we literally had to start from the beginning. I'll never forget that call. It's about 11.30 at night in June. I was in my office at home, and we were on the phone with the CEO and the engineering leader and the sales leader, and we literally had no plan. I mean, no plan. If we took this volume out, we had no volume. And we said we're going to go for it. And so long story short, it's now November, and again, we've got to get this product out by the end of the year. And we've collapsed the uh, cycle to actually uh, to build this product. We're going to start in March, build it through the end of the year, and now we've got about eight weeks left to do this. And uh, Another person that's sitting in the room, Doug Dickinson, who's part of our team today, came up to my office. That's where I managed from at that time. Uh, and this was probably uh, 2008. And I uh, said, you got to come down to the shop floor. You got to see what's going on there. I went down, and I just couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, it was a mess. And we expected people to actually take this design that was still half done and build this product. And we started these gimbal walks. And, it's, and I've never stopped from there, and it's around this daily management. So do you really have standard work? Are people following standard work? Uh, what kind of standard work do leaders have? Uh, from staffing a line to the standard work that people do? Uh, are you truly measuring tack time? Is that what's driving behavior? Uh, the visual management, do people really know what's normal versus abnormal out in your workplaces, whether it's in a shop or in an office? But this was life-changing for me. This is my aha moment that I really did things differently as a leader. And so this whole thought process of you do Kaizen, but when you leave someone at the end of the week with Kaizen, you've got to leave them with standard work and, more importantly, a daily management process to understand if that, daily work, that, that standard work is actually happening. And it's been a real, real game-changer for us. So just talk a little bit more about what that means to me and, as a leader and, and how it's changed my, my life. Uh, when I think about, you know, that day that Doug came to my office, that's where I did stuff. Uh, yeah, I'd go down to a factory, uh, I'd go to a, a fly to a plant, I'd do my token walk, and I'd walk around and shake hands and kind of sniff around and see what was going on. But I led the business through an office. I led it, read, uh, led it through PowerPoints, I led it through Excel spreadsheets, and uh, this was a, a life-changing moment from a leadership standpoint. And I started managing at the Gimba. And that was a change, and that was a real positive change. But what Mike's taught me is another step, and that is really leading at the Gimba. 
And that's not only about out there and checking standard work and seeing how things are going and managing the numbers, but it's really about developing a people. And so when you're out there as a leader, are you asking questions or are you giving answers? Are you really building up that capability of your team or are you just providing uh, direction? And these things, and we're still, again, on a very, very early part of this learning career uh, and journey for us, but uh, we're pretty excited. I know the team that's here with me today, we're, we're very excited about the future of IR. Uh, but we know we've got a long, long way to go. Well, thank you. That's the start. That's not the end of the Ingersoll story uh, to be continued uh, in the years to come. Uh, let me uh, just say one uh, additional thing about Ingersoll. Uh, Mike Lamock, who is the CEO, uh, called up uh, back in the spring as we were getting ready to do this and said, well, gee, why don't we go somewhere and just take a walk? Uh, and the presumption is that I'm the great guru. And look, I don't just try to totally trash that idea because I make a living with that, okay? I mean, come on, this, I got a product line, you know? It's a perfectly legitimate product line. So we decided we would go out to an Ingersoll plant that had really been struggling. And I think there was some question uh, at one point whether this thing was savable. Well, I'll just give, I'll give a little, little background on this. Uh, so. Mike's a, uh, about as calm of a CEO that I've ever been around. I've been around a lot of different CEOs uh, coming from General Electric, some really, really impressive people. And Mike's very atypical. And we're flying back from this, uh, this one visit to this site, and Mike says, uh, uh, don't take me back there, because bad things will happen. And uh, it's about as uh, straightforward as, 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 as in Mike will get. And so this is now uh, a, a year later uh, that we're taking Mike back, and, he hadn't been there, so not only is Mike going back, but bringing Jim along. So this could have been career ending. <laughs> well, you got, the, so you got the great guru. And look, I've seen a lot of terrible things. And by the way, I've seen it in the presence of some terrible CEOs. I mean, just awful, horrible. How could they conceivably hold their job for a day? And they're making 20 million a year. And why is the world unjust? And so on. Well, anyway, we get off. And we go in the plant, and something happened to me that had never happened in my career. This is 35 years of taking walks. Um, we started to, we said, well, let's look at the two value streams that are in this plant, and let's start at the beginning. And by the way, you can start at shipping, you can start at receiving. Uh, you can do it either way. The, to the real hardcore Toyota guys always start at shipping, look at the information flow. That's okay. But anyway, we set off to walk through these plants. This guy's the CEO. This is, what, a $14 billion business. Um, and within about 50 yards, uh, I realized that I was outclassed, that Mike had better eyesight than I did with regard to value and waste, with regard to variation, with regard to control of the process, uh, which is to say I had nothing to say at all. But this was so great, I could just shut up. And uh, you know, something some would say I don't do easily, but, but I can. And what was really interesting, we spent a whole day we're walking along, and in that day, Mike never told anyone to do anything. Uh, that uh, famous uh, Fujio Cho uh, statement about go see, ask why, show respect. Here's a CEO who went to see right to the front, the bottom of the gimba, and he just asked a lot of questions. Why is this happening? What do you think about that? What, 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 why, why, why? And in a very respectful tone. And uh, by the way, everything wasn't perfect. And there were a couple of things we saw that I thought, if this was your classic CEO shouter, who also happened to have some eyesight, uh, this would be the time when the screaming begins. You know, how could you idiots do this? But I hope this is the face of the future. I truly hope. I think if every CEO in America and Canada was like Mike, with regard to their fundamental ability to see and their mindset and their respect for people, uh, this would be truly a uh, world that has changed. So uh, that story is to be continued. Uh, they called up and said, OK, we're now getting the plants, little bit by little bit, we're getting the plants and engineering to sort of work right. Sure. And we're not bragging. We're not bragging. We're sort of Tra getting trains, to work Trains right. are running on time. Yeah. So now, why don't we uh, expand our thinking and think about end to end? So that was the idea in this visit uh, to do this. That's not that first trip with Mike. This is the second trip with Todd and Dan. So we said, OK, fine. Let's just pick, maybe not at random. I don't know exactly how you picked it. But let's pick a product family. And the product family was compressors for home air conditioners. Okay, 
And let's start at the beginning, and let's devote some time, a couple of days, to go take a walk. Now, by the way, the way the world has configured its value streams over the last 25, 30 years, to do this end-to-end -end thing, you really need your own jet. Uh, which fortunately, uh, Warren Buffett and uh, NetJets, uh, you know, I, I guess we paid for it, but Warren provided it. So therefore, it was possible to take this great, great long walk in a reasonably time efficient way. So we went down to Mexico, to Monterey, and we went to uh, bless the guy, a uh, caster. Uh, you think you have it tough. I mean, you're trying to manage a casting operation in Mexico, um, and I'm sure we must have some Mexican folks here. Uh, I just got a lot of respect for what people have to do in a very volatile, dangerous environment uh, to get the job done right. So we started to walk along. And by the way, part of what we were doing was just uh, ticking off the points that are there in the bullets that we were asking, you know, just asking. Uh, do you have standard work? Um, do you have daily management? By the way, this daily management thing, I am so delighted, is really catching on that uh, 10 years ago, uh, most consultants were Kaizen all the time. We will do Kaizen, and then more Kaizen, and then more Kaizen, and then more Kaizen. Never any discussion of management, honestly. And by the way, the moral hazard of the consultant is that if there is no management, you will get spectacular short-term results, and then you will be called back, OK? This is the classic skill trades moral hazard. I will fix your plumbing for you, but I'm not going to tell you how to fix plumbing. Right? And the secret, by the way, is daily management. So we're asking just really simple questions about tack time. Do people know what it is? Do they know what their tack time is? Are they ahead or behind? Do they know whether they're ahead or behind? And then at each step, just asking, uh, is it capable? Is it available? Is it adequate? Is it flexible? So those are things that uh, lots of you have done in your plants already. We were just doing this on an extended scale. But what we were also doing was looking at the connections between those verticals. And so these are sawed off verticals. Those uh, dark gray, blue, uh, green lines, those are where the verticals meet the value stream. And what we were doing was starting with the die caster and then going to the first Ingersoll facility, which is in Mexico, where they did machining and compressor assembly, and then going to a warehouse, and then going to the second Ingersoll facility, now in Texas, and then going to a distribution center, and then going to see a dealer. And uh, the dealer, uh, bless him, uh, this whole delegation from Ingersoll shows up. He'd never, never seen any of you guys. I, I really thought this was to take his franchise away, that uh, he was pretty convinced. The only reason these people could be asking me about how I create value is something bad. Uh, and I think we've now convinced him it's OK. We uh, had quite a bit of correspondence back and forth. But anyway, we walked through, and we took a look. Simplest thing in the world, that we got our sneakers, we're walking along, we're following a value stream from end to end. We're there to see. We're asking why. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And we're trying to show respect. Uh, we shot some video. And we wanted to use the video. And we decided not to use the video. Um, and look, it's a problem. Dan and I, uh, Dan Jones and I were talking earlier. It just kind of dogs our life that we so, see so many wonderful things happening out there that we would love to show you, but we can't do it while respecting people. Because so many of the lessons are about things gone wrong and how humans react to it. And I'm not going to put videos up here of uh, things gone wrong uh, with people, even if they've approved it, even if they've signed a waiver. I'm not going to do it. I just don't think uh, so far away we're going to get the context right. But we did have lots of interesting interactions, and just one that I think I can, can just say a minute about, that uh, they had done in the Tyler, Texas plant, where they had two uh, assembly lines for two, the two separate product families. Uh, they had done a wonderful job of visual scheduling. And they'd done it themselves. I don't think this was consultant assisted. They had just figured out, how can we get the volatility, the variation, the craziness out of our MRP-generated schedule? And instead, we're every morning going to get together and schedule going three days out, four days out. We're all going to meet. Everybody from every silo is going to meet at this schedule board. And we're going to make the trade-offs in real time. Because every time you need to change something, it has an effect for somebody. So the question is, what's the right thing for the plant? What's the right thing for Ingersoll Rand? And it was pretty impressive.
So just give you, uh, again, some more context on this. So this came out of a uh, rapid improvement experiment, what we call our Kaizans. And uh, we were, our whole residential HVAC business was replenishment uh, based on forecast. Uh, it was, had nothing to do about replenishment based on, on demand. And so we, uh, we had this big RIE, and this is our first attempt to go to replenishment uh, by demand uh, on this line. And I'm, I'm seeing it in action for the first time with Jim. And, uh, and, and the competitive disadvantage, this is a stock business that we're providing distribution to. And uh, as we're doing this RIE, uh, that I, I participated in the, in the week, it was a great RIE, uh, the team starts talking about our competition can do this in seven days and we're doing it in 21. And as we talked about all the things that were kind of broken in this business that never came up as a competitive disadvantage around cycle. And so when you think about, you know, our, again, our message around growth, it just really hit home about what we had to do to change and, and, the, and the obstacles in the way of our customers and what value we weren't providing them. So just, again, a little bit more context to how we got to where we were that day. So this is the part I wish we could have captured, that uh, Todd's standing there looking at it. This was not his idea. He's never seen this before. They've gone and done this. And he says, gee, you know, I just, I've just got such respect for your willingness to just take this on. This is a bear. And I'm just proud of you that you want to do this. And by the way, what do you think you ought to do next? And so several in the group say, well, the next thing to do is to make this into a really sophisticated software program. Okay? So I can see the blood draining out, but he doesn't show anything. And he says, well, gee, um, that's great. You know, I mean, hey, you guys are just thinking all the time. But uh, just tell me, what, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And then someone, and this is what I would love to have put up, but we couldn't, said, well, the problem is we don't have sophisticated software. Mm -hmm. And I just hear this all the time. The, the solution is the problem. The problem is the solution. And you say, well, gee, that's really interesting. Now, what was the problem? And they tried again and said, you know, it's, and they, they kept trying until finally they begin to, he's never said anything. They just begin to get the idea. He keeps asking what the problem is. And so he says, well, gee, you know, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. So think about the problem. Wow. In the old days, the boss would have said, you guys are idiots, the lean boss and I'm not paying for software, and the whole point of this visual scheduling thing with the morning meeting is that you have to make trade-offs in real time. Every time you want to change the schedule, it means something different for every department, and you're making those face-to-face trade-offs and taking responsibility. This is the best thing that ever happened to this plant. But instead, you just said, yeah, I'd just like you to think about what the problem really is, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks. So that, to me, is the future uh, of management. Uh, go see, right there, right there, talk to the people, ask why, and as you're doing that, that's the best way you can show respect. So I wish I could have shown that to you, but uh, we just decided it really was not uh, the way we wanted to do it. That wouldn't be respectful. All right, so we took this walk from end to end. It took us a couple of days. Uh, we had a good time, uh, got to know each other a bit. We hadn't really had any contact before. And we got to the end, we could have uh, drawn a really, really complicated uh, scoreboard. And if you get the Seeing the Whole value stream book, well, it's a much more elaborate version of what we did. But the things that we saw, which were not the least bit surprising, is that there were all these steps that are necessary with the current configuration of the value stream, but no consumer would think of any value. When you go to buy a product, you do not ask how much has it been reworked. By the way, when you're trying to build an air conditioner, you've got a lot of brazing, and that means you've got a lot of rework in today's world. Uh, that's been put up and put down and boxed and unboxed and reboxed and unboxed and, and so forth. No con customer has ever said how many times have you packed this thing and unpacked it on the way from raw material to me, right? So therefore, you find that 10% of the steps are actually value creating. And many of the people we were talking to just never really thought about this. It's just obvious. You know, we've got to ship it from plant to plant to plant. We have to box it and unbox it. That's life. And indeed, the way things work right now, that is life. But think about, does the customer actually value any of this? Uh, people still just uh, chronically and persistently confuse work with value. If I'm working hard and doing my work right, I must be creating value. That's an interesting proposition. Nine cases out of 10, it's wrong. So we have to think about that. So that's one thing that jumps out. Uh, then time. 
And so what you see, and this is just so typical of the world, it takes 44 days to do 14 minutes of work. Okay, well now, by the way, if it takes you 44 days, well, you have to forecast 44 days out, and what we know about forecast is, of course, they're wrong. So here we have a problem. But again, you're just used to this, and so 44 days, well, gosh, it used to take us 60, so we're doing pretty good. Well, not really, but let's think about that. And then distance, I mean, we put that in feet. But as you see, it takes millions of feet to do a few feet of work. If you could have just cellularized in one cell this whole activity, well, all the forecasting and scheduling uh, problems go away. But wait a minute, uh, right now we can't do that. Uh, we can move toward that once we raise our awareness. But the other thing we noted as we walked along is just the total disconnects between the functions. You got purchasing looking out the back door, and what they're looking for is price variance, positive price variance. And in a previous uh, regime with different management, uh, the idea was do it anywhere in the world you can get the lowest piece part price, right? And by the way, when you're looking out the back door, all you see in purchasing is the price saving. What you don't see is the cost increase inside the company when you try to deal with uh, parts from suppliers uh, who are strangers and on the other side of the world. And all of this onshoring stuff with the total cost of ownership, which I hope you're paying attention to and I hope you're using, is just simply trying to do total company math, total value stream math, rather than point math. So, so just, uh, I'll just give you, a, yeah. again, some context, uh, just how prevalent you know, some of these silos get built up. I'm doing a walk, and uh, it's a, a different value stream than Jim and I took, and, but just on this purchase price mm -hmm. variance uh, subject, and uh, we're at our mission control, which shows our initial value stream and our current value stream and our future value stream. And the, the, the real bottleneck here is we've got the supplier, this is, a, this is a factory in China, we've got the supplier in China that would move from a very close localized supplier near the factory to, uh, to, the, to the west. And uh, the cycle has just like gone crazy and really starting to affect our customers. And so we had this conversation at the, at the board and, and you know, just, Keep, the answer keeps coming back, well, it was 15% cheaper, 15% cheaper. And we go now take a walk out into the factory and we're walking the line and we get to this line and we see the line's missing tack time and you start asking why and it's because of this casting. It's not because not only do we can't get it, but when we get it, it's, it's not working, uh, it's leaking. And so you kind of come back to this team and it's, you got the sourcing guy there and you got the plant manager there and they say, so, so tell me again why we changed this supplier and they say, well, it's 15% cheaper. It's right in front of their eyes, you know, that it, it, they, they can't make product because they can't get it. And when they can get it, it's got quality problems. But it's back to the silo about a metric driving the wrong behavior and not seeing this, this value stream over these silos. And I just think that's so prevalent out there just in, in our worlds today. And it's what we saw all, along this walk for sure. And, and then when you're looking at the front door, what you see is sales. Uh, and this company is not particularly a promotion-driven company, but they do have quarters and years, and they do try to make their quarters and years. And they'll do what they have to do to do it. And for all sales guys, they are incentivized on revenue. More revenue is better. Uh, they're not judged on cost. So you're doing all these things that impose cost on the total value stream, but more revenue at your point. You win, but the company loses. And indeed, the whole value stream loses. So we weren't surprised that we saw these things. And actually, the point of the walk, this is next, the most important point, is to force to the surface all of the contradictions between the supplier and the company and the sales company, and between the departments and the divisions all the stuff that people try so hard to suppress that no one wants to talk about, we have no problem. Uh, the whole point here is to force the problem to the surface where we can actually all together, face to face, talk about it. And say, how do we want to run our company? What's the right thing for Ingersoll Rand's customer? So forget about you, forget about your department, even forget about us versus our supplier. What's the right thing for the customer? This is such a simple, painful, hard, helpful conversation. That Jim, I think the, the, the whole conversation for us, I know, and I, I don't know if many of you face the same challenges, but even kind of starting out with this and saying this was about growth and people seeing the, even their Kaizen schedule, you know, and how they were going to achieve, people really thought about productivity. And we, we kept talking about, look, if you have growth, it's about leverage, right? So we want to leverage the cost structure. If this becomes cost out, we're not growing. 
okay? Because if you're not growing, you've got to take costs down and increase margins. But we kept emphasizing over and over again about it's about growth. And you get into this purchase price variance that the teams are so set from what we've driven from behaviors, right? I mean, on the metrics we put in place as leaders uh, that have us so cost-driven and not growth-driven. And, and it's just this, this huge, massive undertaking of, of changing the culture inside of, at least our, I know, yeah. our, our home. Yeah. So we got to the end, and we all looked at each other. And uh, I asked a very simple question. I said, okay, now let me get this straight. Uh, I think I know the answer, but who designed this value stream? The answer is no one. No one. No one designed this. There was no designer. There's no chief engineer here. And indeed, that's why I was there, that the small role I had to play was a person with no skin in the game. Didn't work for any of the companies, didn't work in any of the departments. Uh, I could just ask these very simple, obvious questions. So you shouldn't need me. And minus me, most of you don't have anything. There's nobody responsible. Nobody is designing are leading a conversation about design. And then looking forward, there's no one designing the future. Uh, you are now used to the idea that you need a plan for every part, right? That's not revolutionary. And you have, I hope, a plan for every employee and a plan for every machine, a maintenance plan. But no one seems to have a plan for every value stream. Isn't that a logical thing to have? And wouldn't uh, that be a good thing for you? So as you go uh, on about your life, once you get out of here, we'll think about that. And indeed, let me just uh, propose a final piece at the end here. For those of you who think you are ready, and by the way, if you've done nothing whatever to lean your plants, uh, please do that first. Uh, you can't do the rest of this if you haven't done that. But if you had made some serious progress, well then maybe it's time to do an experiment on a plan for your value stream. And you pick one, okay? And uh, how many value streams have you got? Well, wait a minute, probably most of you don't know. They know, and the whole company, they know the answer to that question. How many value streams do they have? You pick one, you don't need me, uh, do not call. Uh, it's not what I normally do. I only do these in preparation for shows like this. <laughs> and take a walk with everyone. I can't overemphasize how important it is to have representatives of every area, every department, every function, every firm. Take a walk together and have a conversation about the contradictions. Okay, and then create a current state summary of where you stand. By the way, the uh, seeing the whole book shows you how to do a scoreboard. Uh, if you've got one, uh, you can do it. If you haven't got one, you can look at somebody else's. I'm not trying to sell you a book, but uh, this is easy to do. And then you say, what's the gap? What's the gap for our customer in terms of what we need to be able to provide versus what this value stream is actually able to provide in the way of quality and responsiveness and cost and functionality and anything else? And then see if you can reach agreement on how you can close that gap. It's that simple. OK, so think about that uh, as you go home. Do you actually have a operational workable definition of your value streams? Is anybody responsible? Do you have a plan? Do you know what the gap is? Before you just do random improvement, uh, what's the gap? And then finally, uh, I honestly think this is a terrific opportunity for those of you in operational excellence. Uh, by the way, one of the great things about operational excellence at Ingersoll, this is the correct answer, is it reports to effectively the COO. Okay, you've got to get operational excellence out of the silos and reporting to the COO so that they can treat all verticals equally. And by the way, there's nobody else who's going to be thinking horizontally. This is just a great opportunity for operational excellence to, for each value stream, organize the walk, determine the current state, get agreement on the gap, help people devise the plan, and then on a continuing basis, monitor performance. And these are not metrics performance, this is the performance of the value stream, of the process of how it's actually working. Not how it's supposed to work, but how it's actually working. And that work of doing that, that goes on forever. You'll have lifetime jobs. And you don't even need to change the org chart, because actually you're just taking responsibility for activities 
for which you have no authority. You have no authority. You can't make anything happen except lead the conversation, expose the contradictions, speak respectfully while asking why, while going to see, so that you're actually talking about this on the gimba. So I think it's a terrific opportunity for those of you who have decided to make a career in process excellence, or in operational excellence, or in continuous improvement. Lift your game a little bit, look at the whole. Look at the big picture, nobody else is. If not you, who, if not now, when, as they say. And then, of course, uh, you will be well on your way to acting your way to horizontal thinking. Uh, John Shook has a great phrase, uh, which I use as often as I can, that it is much easier to act your way to lean thinking than it is to think your way to lean acting. I urge you to get your sneakers, get a jet if necessary, and take the bus otherwise. Get out there <laughs> on the gimba and start acting your way to horizontal thinking because that's what is going to change the world. Thank you. Thank you.